I'm going to talk about visual writing systems. Um, I'm a scribe, or some people know it as gra um, graphic recording. Um, there we go. Um, so what that means is I go to meetings, conferences, gatherings, and as conversations are unfolding amongst groups, I'm sort of trying to pull some of that wisdom from the conversation into a map so that we can have uh, visually what we're talking about. Everybody knows that when you cross languages, you get more nuanced meanings from things. And so my whole thing is that writing visual writing systems as they're emerging through graphic recording and um, through other writing systems in a contemporary way, um, I'm trying to do some rooting into where they come from because you know, we've got emojis, we've got like social media, you know, little like teaches on the uh, Instagram stuff. We're just becoming more of a visual, there's more visual writing happening. And I, I want to ground that in a decolonial context is kind of my thing. So I'm going to give an example. I've been starting to learn Nahuatl, which is an um, indigenous language from Mexico um, of some of my ancestors. And Nahuatl was written in pictures, in carvings, in the architecture. It was not an alphabetic. It was a spoken language that was never written in an alphabet. And there's a reason for that. And so Tlaltecutli is a good example. Tlaltecutli means Earth Lord. And as that deity got translated into Spanish and then English, we see a lot that that, that deity gets translated as earth goddess or earth mother because the earth was sort of um in other parts of the cosmology considered as a sort of feminine realm um but that's that's inco incongruent with the language and one of the reasons why visual writing was useful for um, that cosmology is because visuals visuals create a more flexible cosmology. It's possible to have a complex gender system when the writing, the symbol for that being is an image that doesn't necessarily have to come with a pronoun. So um, like I said, Tlaquilos were the people who were, it was their role to be um, scribes and they were painters. They were um, a part of ritual and ceremony they're, um, they were record makers of, of the Nahuatl cosmology. That was a lot, um, part of their, part of their work was to make record of a cosmology that was complex and, um, flexible in the way that people understood things. So, um, fast forward past sort of, you know, 200 years of uh, what we know as colonization and genocide. And my field of people, of practitioners who are writing practitioners are like, you know, we just invented this new visual writing system, um, which is kind of the hallmark of the, or the blueprint, the genetic blueprint of colonization, right? Is like erase something um, and then come back and, and claim that you've discovered it. So for, for scribes and for any, for scribes, artists, people who are just note taking or people who are interested in knowledge production via um, like collective practices, right? So like how we make knowledge together. I think it's important to just kind of name that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of pre-colonial languages and some that still are intact today that used visual writing systems as legitimate forms of knowledge production. And so when we're talking about text, when we're talking about knowledge, you know, moving outside of the sort of Western understanding that knowledge gets produced in books, it gets, it comes out of um, academia. Um, th this kind of like anchors us in like, no, we produce knowledge by like, the ways that we embroider our fabric or the patterns that we paint um, or how we construct our houses. And we can, we can develop literacies to be reading one another. We can read our bodies. We can read our clothing because everything is a language. Like Mark was saying, it, it, it's, it's been flattened um, 
but there is there are like a massive amount of ways that we're generating creating knowledge and so in order to do that to be creating new not only creating new knowledge but creating new epistemologies of how we know things um, in a contemporary way i think it's really important to just tell the truth about what has happened and all of the indigenous cosmologies and epistemologies that have been erased okay that's my little soapbox um, so for folks who want to be practicing this, maybe you're a doodler, maybe you, uh, you know, got to get on the mic sometimes, maybe you, you don't draw at all, but we all speak metaphorically, we speak in symbols, we speak in, in language as well. My sort of, you know, invitations are um, start listening from an embodied way deeper than words. How do you listen to people communicating through their feeling for them, sensation, intuition, dreams, um, five senses and beyond. And then another practice that I invite is to write decolonially. So some of those beautiful um, things that um, Sabine and RJ shared from Temel Kuhn, right? Like the sort of like cultural norms that get erased. How do we how do we listen to a group and create knowledge together and share that knowledge back to people that's not looking to control or master information or consider people as resources or even consider the earth as resources? You know, how can we be um, showing back like what we're listening and then reflecting it back in a sort of like participatory process um, in a way that's decolonial? And for the 10 minutes that we have together, I'm gonna to focus on the, down, the second point of distributing resource. This is a kind of somatic piece that I've learned from being a somatic practitioner around distribution as a sort of like what to do when things get too intense or what to do when there's, you know, we're kind of, our society is now organized because there's hoarding of resources, power. And so distribution is almost always a useful way to be working <coughs> with imagery. So when you're working with imagery, placing challenges in relationship to resource can help create flow as people get to see back what their processes are. Um, identifying challenges that are too large for the group to metabolize and inviting external resources to support that. And inviting people, identifying people in points where resource is blocked or stuck and, and just visualizing flow. So you know, that could look like drawing big streaks, that could look like arrows, it can be super, super simple. So I'll give a little example of a piece that I did with a group um, about a year ago. This group was trying to change the world, y'all, and um, had a whole lot of challenge in it. So right away, um, talking about transformation, I drew them these giant snakes because snake medicine from the lineages that I've studied is a, is a symbol of transformation, how the snakes shed their skin. There are indigenous people in the room and they introduced um, the space with this, with this saying that means hello other self as, as their greeting. So I put that right in the middle um, to center our conversation around it. Um, on the left, you can see I wrote B, 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 fix, fix, do, 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 do. And that was because the conversation kept going back to the same, same piece around like, we have to do more, we have to do do things different, we have to change things in action. And there was, there was a need to talk about being. Um, and so I just put that over and over and over again. Um, I'll do another one here. This is the next day. So there was a lot of tightness on the first day. So I opened this up with some giant strokes across the page to open up some flow in my body and, and in the cultural body. I started putting in these little roots that could weave some of the ideas together. There were people there from policy and from the private sector and from government and, um, and, and they needed to be woven together. Um, the bees I put in really big, that was an example of like bringing in some external resources of when the conversation was like, how do we do this? And like, what do we need? What kind of like, what will it take for us to do this? The bees were just like the ways that bees live communally in a hive, everyone with a role, um, 
the way that they dance as communication was just like the metaphor that like opened up um, resource to support that, that process. So um, I have one more and I'll just invite you all to pop open, like take your mics off and, and see what you notice in terms of what are the resources that you see in this image and what might some challenges be that you see in this image and how might they be talking to one another. Um, feel free to write it in the chat or uh, open your mic and share out loud. Yeah, so crystals in the corner, human touch, those were resources. Yep, healing hands. Yeah, and there was a lot of flow in this room. So so that was more of a reflection in this conversation than it was like what I sort of assessed was a need. Mm -hmm. I love the magnifying glass and then the scissors and dismantling the nation state. Were it to be so easy, right? <laughs> Somehow visually now it's possible. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah, and I also just as a as a as another piece, I work with the color black a lot because of um visually I think that the color black gets um really entangled with anti-blackness at least in the United States. Although um, I'm sure that happens in other parts of the world. And so it's important to me to visually put black in my, in my pieces that show um, um, beauty and the mystery of what can't be known in the light and the expansiveness and the, the, the importance of, um, of darkness and not just um, using that as a color that denotes something that's bad or shadowy or, or yeah so I've got we've got that in the, the figure on the left that says I am spirit embodied and then some of the treasures that exist in the darkness in the left corner mm 